£1,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. I'm Martin Daubney. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. It's 9pm, I'm Patrick Christie's Tonight. We've seen violence in Calais, but now an illegal migrant has been stabbed on a small boat. Are we importing violent thugs? Also, these six pledges are now carved in stone. <laughs> Is Ed Miliband a dangerous eco-fanatic who's about to make you poorer? Plus, you'll never... Fair advantages white people have in your force. You will never guess the answer to that very simple question. Lee joins us in the studio shortly, and... Jihadis behind bars. Are Islamists forcing prisoners to convert? On my panel is the director of Popular Conservatives, Mark Littlewood, landlord Adam Brooks, and author Rebecca Reed. And find out why woke students have barricaded themselves into a university building. Free! Get ready, Britain. Here we go. Beware the eco-fanatic coming for your money. Next. Good evening. The top story tonight, as you've been hearing, an illegal migrant is in hospital tonight after being stabbed on board a small boat attempting to cross the English Channel today. UK authorities, including Border Force and two lifeboats, attended the scene just before lunchtime and officers are trying to establish exactly what happened. The victim, we understand, has non-life-threatening injuries. The dinghy was one of eight small boats that reached UK shores today on the busiest day of channel crossing so far this year, with a record 450 migrants arriving. That takes the total number of migrants coming to the UK illegally this year to nearly 4,000. Meanwhile, passage of the government's flagship Rwanda bill is now delayed until after Easter, when MPs will have to vote again after several votes against it by the House of Lords today. Our political editor, Christopher Hope, has the latest. 
Here in the House of Lords tonight, peers have voted to say that migrants can only be sent to Rwanda when all the measures in the Rwanda Treaty have been satisfied, and that could take a while. Another amendment passed by the, by the peers here says the bill must have due regard for international law. And so the ping-pong process continues, but the government is very clear it will ensure, it will try and force this measure through Parliament to ensure that flights can take off. It rolls on now, probably till after Easter, when we expect another battle between the Commons and the Lords. Chris Hope there. Let's bring you up to date with events in Wales. I can bring you some uh, breaking news developments from the last few minutes in Wales. We understand new Welsh Labour leader Vaughan Gething has been sworn in as First Minister of Wales. He, of course, succeeds Mark Drakeford, who resigned yesterday after holding the position since 2018. Mr Gething was elected as the Welsh Government leader by members of the Senate earlier on today. He's expected to form a cabinet in the next few days. Meanwhile, in Ireland, Leo Varadkar has announced he's stepping down as Prime Minister. The 45-year-old says he's recognised and resigned as the leader of the Fine Gael party immediately and will stay on as Taoiseach until his successor is chosen. Mr Varadkar became the first openly gay man to lead the Irish government when he came out during the 2015 marriage equality referendum. Junior doctors in England have voted by 98% to continue their strike action in the long-running dispute over pay. The British Medical Association is requesting a 35% pay rise, which the government has previously said is unreasonable. There have been 10 walkouts so far by junior doctors since the first one in March last year. And more than one in five police officers, they say, are planning to resign in the next two years. The Police Federation of England and Wales said around 22% said they plan to quit. 85% of those polled said they're not fairly paid, given the dangers they face in the job, with 15% saying they'd suffered one or more injuries in the last year. That's the news. For the latest stories, do sign up to GB News Alerts. Scan the QR code on your screen right now or go to gbnews.com alerts. If Labour wins the next election, you will be made a lot poorer by a dangerous climate fanatic with a track record of disaster, in my view. Ed Miliband, remember him? Well, yes, he will become one of the most important people in the country. The energy minister with a big majority backed up by a load of 20-something-year-old kids behind him on the Labour benches obsessed with going green. He will be able to do whatever he wants. Here he is calling for an acceleration towards net zero only yesterday. And I want to make the case for acceleration. Above all, I think there is a stark election choice. Labour's case, which I'm going to make today for climate action, is the route to lower energy bills, energy security, good jobs, and doing our duties by future generations against a Conservative Party which is slipping from climate delay into denial, which will mean higher bills, energy insecurity, fewer jobs and betrayal of future generations. So let's look at what Ed wants and what that means for you. Today it was revealed he wants to bring back the boiler tax. Under the measures, boiler makers are set to be fined if they fail to meet certain targets for heat pump installations. Manufacturers will charge you more. A heat pump can cost as much as £12,000. Labour will probably subsidise that, so your tax will go up. What they don't tell you is that a trial found that 81% of homes fitting a heat pump needed a new cylinder and 93% needed new radiators. So you will have to pay for that as well. Oh, and you'll also have to insulate your home. And even when you've done that, when it gets into minus temperatures, your energy bill could be £50 a day. He wanted to launch a £28 billion green energy plan which Labour scrapped because it was unworkable and unaffordable. He somehow managed not to get sacked or forced to resign over that. Well... Mr Miliband still wants that £28 billion, pounds, which should be a huge concern for everybody because he simply does not care about wasting public money. In fact, he is probably the most expensive policymaker in British history. He was the Cabinet Minister in Gordon Brown's government and put forward legislation committing Britain to an 80% cut in CO2 emissions. International cost estimates put it at over £1 trillion. Pounds. He was responsible for Labour getting into bed with Just Stop Oil. He brought Dale Vince into the party's bosom, literally being OK with climate fanatics there. Mr Miliband pushed for no new oil and gas licences. That cost Labour support with the unions. 
So you could argue that he's quite bad at politics as well. Although we already knew that, didn't we? Because after he knifed his own brother in the back, he unveiled his stone tablets of pledges like a socialist Moses, only to get a kicking at the general election and pave the way for Jeremy Corbyn to lead the Labour Party. These six pledges are now carved in stone. <laughs> The Edstone, by the way, in case you're wondering where it is, was last seen at a pub garden somewhere around the Chelsea area. Seriously, what a legacy. He pushed for Labour to commit to the national grid being carbon-free by 2030, which is apparently impossible. Yesterday, the national grid said that it could not possibly hit net zero until at least 2035. A week ago, he said that he would lift the de facto block on onshore wind farms at the stroke of a pen. So if you live in a rural area with a nice view, you can wave goodbye to that. It's completely pointless anyway. Just today, our national grid shows that we got almost as much energy from France as we did from wind. Gas and nuclear leading the way. Everything this man has touched has either been an expensive disaster, reversed, unworkable, or deemed to be impossible to achieve. He might say he's a dreamer. Well, he'd be an absolute nightmare for your bank balance. Let's get the thoughts now of my panel. I am joined this evening by the director of the Popular Conservatives, Mark Littlewood. I've got businessman and activist Adam Brooks and author and journalist Rebecca Reid. I'm just going to ask you, Mark, do you think that Ed Miliband might be quite a dangerous eco-fanatic? He clearly is. He said it out pretty clearly, Patrick. The, if you think the Conservative government's been a bit wacky on net zero, and I do, uh, if Labour forms the next government, they're going to double down. Pretty much the Tories have binned. I mean, they've postponed, but they've basically binned this boiler tax. And it is nuts. There's a complicated ratio about if you were going to install more gas boilers, you've got to install a certain number of heat pumps. So let's imagine you need a new gas boiler. It may well be the manufacturer says to you, sorry, mate, you're going to have to wait until we've installed a heat pump for Mark Littlewood. So we're going to get queues, backlogs and the rest. Even if you believe we need to decarbonise, and there's a separate argument about that, this is not the way to do it. Governments banning things and mandating things is not a successful way to, re to reduce CO2, even if that's a priority for you. Yeah, the reason why I'm getting so exercised about this is we have to look at what's probably going to happen at the next election. Probably going to be quite a large Labour majority. A lot of their candidates appear to be in their early to mid-twenties, from what we can <coughs> gather. They, I would imagine, have probably signed up quite heavily to this eco agenda. Then Ed Miliband can come forward and do all of the things that he's wanted to do for quite a while. And as far as I can tell, Adam, a lot of those things are going to make us all a heck of a lot poorer. 100%. This, this idea that our bills are going to be lower because of renewables and stuff in, in the future is fantasy land. Our bills are going to go up under a Labour government. That's for certain. It's not I mean, for certain. You it can't is say, for certain. It's not for certain. It you is. don't know, I don't know. You can't say things for certain. It, it, it's just it not okay to certain. say on television that things are like, certain when it's not anyone, provable. Anyone that is invested in this net zero uh, future cannot be trusted in my, in, in my view. The science does not back up that anything that we do in this country, whether it's heat pumps, um, electric cars, or, you know, ULES schemes, is going to alter the climate or the world temperatures one bit. It's fantasy land. It's, it's a way to control us. It's a way to tax us. And this is going to get turbocharged under a Labour government. Right. Rebecca, I can see you massively opposing that. Go on. I just think we have to be so careful when we say things like certainly when things are not certain or provable. I understand why you've got to those conclusions, but those are still opinions. You can't say something well, certain well, when it's not provable. A lot of economists going, are saying that. But what's focusing going on. on this, because some are, some aren't, it's not certain. 71% um, of people in the UK, according to YouGov, do support net zero. Now, that's not to say that they want net zero by 2030. I think a lot of people accept that 2030 is an unrealistic stretch goal. 2035 feels reasonable. Probably a compromise between the two, 2050 for the Tories, 2030 for the, for the uh, Labour... I think 2040 feels reasonable. But the majority of people in this country do want net zero to happen. So there is a reason that both parties are attempting to achieve right. this with their policies. I think there is also a reason why, when you take opinion polls like that, you get the results like that. Yeah, that, well, you, Gov. Yeah, no, that's exactly... I, uh, this is the key difference between a stated preference and a revealed preference. If you ask people, do you want carbon net zero, they'll say yes. 
as if you could wave a magic wand and bring it about. Most people and would want And as if they it. understand it. But if you start to say, are you happy to never go on a foreign holiday again? Or, but it wouldn't or, be never going well, on a foreign holiday. I mean, no are you happy to that. make these sacri the sacrifices needed to get to net mm. zero are very mm. meaningful. And unless those are built into the question, Simply asking whether you like net zero as a I concept think, doesn't really get. I think to perhaps that. I doesn't, perhaps I trust on, on, people's on the, intellectual capacity more than you do. Well, well, I think no, people no, aren't no, stupid. They, they, they don't have to be stupid. They're asked, "Do you want net zero?" But you actually have to delve right. into whether they're willing to pay the cost for it. Yeah. And in terms of is your energy going to get cheaper or not? Well, if Ed Miliband thinks it's going to get cheaper, we don't need to subsidise anything. Mm. We don't need government intervention. Well, you do the market will find cost... a way of, well, of you... producing it. You well, the do market will provide that. Cost... Equity will provide that. If you can provide me with cheaper energy through, I don't know, wind turbines, something else, fine, get on and do it and invest in that yeah, technology. That's not, that's not, that's one of the not... other points, though, as well, as well, I will come to you in a second, but, but... one of the other points, Ed <laughs> Miliband, is that he does have a track record of the things that he's doing, either not coming to fruition, him not buying into it himself with the old electric car thing, which I believe he now has actually sorted, that was nice of him, you know, mm. or actually getting pulled because it was like, too expensive and unworkable, and now this guy could be let off the leash. But, look, Ed Miliband himself won't even answer how we're going to deal with the, the wind and solar intermittency. You know, what, what's going to happen if we shut the, the gas power stations? Mm. The lights are going to go out. This is unachievable. It is fantasy nonsense, and it's going to cost... The, the, the taxpayer and the, the citizen in the pocket. But this is this is what people... I understand that people might want to vote Labour because, well, they might just support Labour, of course, but they also think the Tories have been a complete shower, and the Tories have been a complete shower, and all of that is absolutely fine. But do they also know that they are going to get this guy and what that means for their bills? I mean, I think that Labour also has a track record of when Ed Miliband does things that don't feel terribly sensible, they stop him from going any further with them. Yeah, he hasn't actually know, done any of these things. I don't think they want to sack anybody at the moment. I think they're keeping things calm and sensible. I'm not suggesting that I think this is the perfect solution. I'm a big advocate of nuclear power because it is clean and it would move us towards net zero and it is a very sensible mm. option. So we need to be having a sensible conversation. But the, what seems to happen is immediately when we try and talk about it, people just go to ignore it all, shut it all down, no sacrifices, no compromises. And that's... People People want cleaner air, people want better lives for their children, people would want not... to be able to have a safe world for the future. Well, but would you not want... Do you not think it's reasonable to try to shut a guy down who has consistently and persistently floated some terrible ideas that have been rubbish by pretty much loads of people? I mean, also, he wrapped his arms around Just Stop Oil. We talk a lot, don't we, about extremism and politics and all of this. I don't think this gets spoken about enough. You know, Ed Miliband was yeah. more than happy for Dale Vince to give money to the Labour Party, to welcome him into the Labour Party... Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. I can't think of a single policy area I agree with Med Ed Miliband on. This is hugely expensive. Uh, you know, I, I think virtually everybody is an environmentalist. That's not the question. Everybody wants cleaner air and a better planet for our children. The question is, is this the way to go about but it and get it? you don't get that without and I'm sacrifice highly sceptical. This is and our hugely schools expensive. and the media are painting one picture that if you buy an electric car, you get a heat pump, the temperature's going to all settle down well, around the world. Right, I, about think, the scientific not I well. don't think anyone's suggesting that overnight, if everybody gets an electric car and a heat pump, everything is fixed. Of course, countries but that are pumping that out massive emissions are a problem. Nothing that we do in this country changes That's the climate in the world. That, it is we're true. About 1 we're one percent. We can still carbon. make a difference, and also we are what we okay. should be world leaders. We should be leading what, what people do. But, but, but is that not a luxury view to have mm. from someone who is maybe more comfortable than most people? You know, and, and if we get a Labour government and they do want to press ahead with this, is it not reasonable to actually say at some point they're going to have to look Dorothy from number 42 in the eye and say, you know what, sorry we made you pay seven grand, by the way, we subsidised yeah. the rest of it, for a heat pump. We didn't tell you that you had to put new radiators in. We didn't tell you that you'd also had to insulate your house. We didn't tell you that when, didn't it, gets, tell you they're when crap. it gets it to is... minus six that you're still going to end up paying 50 quid a day for your energy. But honestly, we're world leading now. Uh, the Chinese don't care. I care. I care about the planet and I care about the difference we can make. And we cannot put pressure on other countries to do these things if we don't do them ourselves. If we want to see improvement, we have to make improvements. But, the, I mean, one a, a, a number to conjure with is that uh, many more people die of hypothermia in the, United, in the United Kingdom every year than die of climate change. Now, you might worry about what climate change might look like in the future, but at the moment, as we stand today, well, extreme... more deaths from hypothermia... Yeah, so climate change doesn't just mean getting hotter, it means extreme weather. Yeah, yeah, but... but Many, many more people are dying of hypothermia. Yes, but that's also an example change. of extreme so there, weather. There are trade offs between right. heating becoming more expensive that, that can actually lead to death. That's still extreme weather. It's going to so cost 58 billion for the national grid to reconfigure.
figure for 2035. So imagine he brings this forward. What is it going to cost the taxpayer? But this is the thing. A lot. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of money. And when people are going out there and voting at the next election, I can understand, you know, a variety of different reasons in that ballot box. And all of them are in time. Be prepared for higher oh, bills. I think it might be worth noting that Ed Miliband clearly holds a huge amount of sway in Keir Starmer's shadow cabinet, quite possibly soon to be cabinet. And do you want all of that stuff? Anyway. Don't miss out on your chance to win our Great British Spring Giveaway. Tech treats in £12,345 in tax-free cash. Aha. It's an amazing prize and it could be yours. Here's how you can enter. There's still time to win our giveaway packed with seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Cash to make your bank account bloom. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 £145 in tax free cash. Text GB Win to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE19 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. All right, loads coming your way. In the last few hours, Rishi Sunak has met with the 1922 committee after a reported flurry of letters of no confidence. Former deputy chair of the Tory party, Lee Anderson, he joins me live with his exclusive insight, and you will never believe the response he got to this question today from a woke fire rescue boss. Unfair advantages white people have in your force. Basic question, but up next in the head to head, a government report says woke diversity, equality and inclusion schemes are a waste of money and don't work. Has the relentless focus on diversity been bad for Britain? Broadcaster Benjamin Butterworth and YouTuber Pearl Davies, they do battle and that's next. Stay tuned. Mark Dolan tonight. Weekends from 9 p.m. I've personally been very torn on whether Prince Harry should have full police protection when he's in the United Kingdom. On the one hand, why should taxpayers fork out for somebody that's left the country and the institution? He is no longer a working, serving royal. But I don't think it matters. He is one of the most famous men in the world, and whether he's a royal or not... He is an ambassador for this country. And he still does good. Charitable causes, the Invictus Games, and he is still a nice and charming guy with a heart. And whilst he has left the royal family and departed these shores, he was and remains the son of King Charles. That is a biological fact. Well, let's hope so. And it wasn't his choice to be born into royalty. It wasn't his choice to be the son of the king. And for that reason, I think he should have equal police protection to his brother William when he is in this country. He couldn't be a more high-profile figure, and unfortunately, like all the royals, Harry will be a target for some very bad people. I fear that if, God forbid, anything happened to him or his family, the authorities would have blood on their hands. So, it's not often that I back Prince Harry. But on this one, he has my support. Look what happened to his poor mum, killed in a Paris tunnel in the 1990s with an allegedly drunk chauffeur. A top royal security insider recently told me that Diana would still be with us today if she had had top royal protection at that time. So let's not make the same mistake twice. Prince Harry needs full protection and the best we've got Yes, he might be a numpty, but he's our numpty. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. 
I'm Michelle Dubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Don't miss Lee Anderson's blistering takedown of a virtue signalling council chief in Parliament. That's coming up, but right now it's time for our head to head. The scourge of equality, diversity, and inclusion training ravaging our institutions, EDI for short, is said to be having little to no impact on reducing prejudice. That's according to a damning new government report. Despite local councils spending on EDI roles doubling to a staggering 52 million quid, Equalities Minister Kemi Badenoch told the Daily Telegraph many EDI practices such as diversity training have not only been proven to be ineffective, they've also been counterproductive. One example is the report about the RAF focusing on hiring women and ethnic minorities, which led to unlawful positive discrimination against white men, quite literally sacrificing the defence of the realm there. Elsewhere, the BBC is splashing out around £600,000 a year on EDI training, Labour a whopping £1.4 million, and the bloated NHS, here we go, £13 million on diversity officers and training courses. So, what do you think? Has the relentless focus on diversity and inclusion been bad for Britain. Let me know your thoughts. Email me gbviews at gbnews.com. Tweet me at gbnews and make sure you go and take part in our poll. The results to follow shortly. But doing battle on this now is broadcaster Benjamin Butterworth and YouTuber Pearl Davis. Um, look, I always go ladies first. Pearl, I'll start with you. Do you think diversity and inclusion and equality has made Britain worse? I don't think we need these programs. We're not, we're not asking for this. You know, I, I, I don't, you can't eliminate prejudice. You, you can't put in a program and eliminate prejudice. I don't think we need it. I don't think we need special treatment and programs just because I am born a woman. OK, Benjamin, what do you think? Do you think it's, it's more, done more to drive a wedge between us? Well, look, I appreciate that at least Pearl has been honest, that she doesn't care about prejudice. She doesn't care if women are on the receiving end of discrimination. She says there's no point trying to overcome it because you can't. At least that's an honest answer to people well, I mean, that want gonna, exclusion what, what gonna and narrow-minded workplaces. Like, what are you going to put in a programme that's well, going to make is, someone prejudice the not prejudice? Well, of course, prejudice, if, by if definition... Oh, that's all right. Well, sorry, sorry. Ahead, prejudice, by definition, is a learned behaviour. You know, none of us are born hating black people or women or gay people, but some people develop those hatreds. They develop them in subtle ways or acute okay. ways and that causes serious problems. And I think when you talk about workplaces, when you have those kind of attitudes that can be prevalent and that can be subtle, that means that people of those minority descriptions can't fulfil their potential. Okay. I just think if these programmes were effective, they would be working. They're clearly not. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of money. And I don't need special treatment because I'm a woman. I think the best person for the job should get the job. There shouldn't be preferential hiring practices. So tell me this, when you have a workplace, as would have been commonplace uh, a couple of decades ago and still clearly exists today, whereby you have a load of white men who have deeply sexist attitudes, who why simply... Do, why do we who assume, simply why but do let we, me finish the question. No, but, but your preference, like, why are we assuming that they're sexist? Well, I'm telling you, uh, not long ago in this country, as in America, I'm sure, you have offices where they're run by old white men who have prejudiced attitudes to women, who believe they aren't as clever, who offices? believe they aren't as capable. Don't pretend that this doesn't if, exist, but if Patrick. So that's much of your audience. So sexist, and the fact is... Let, whoa, and the fact whoa, is... Okay. If they were whoa, whoa, so sexist, the fact why did they let women in? They didn't have to. I can't, if I can't finish my question, <laughs> then you can't answer it. The fact is that when you have a scenario where you have a load of people with those prejudices, then you need policies to help people develop uh, their views. Oh, I'm going to be really honest with you, eh? You know, I, I'm quite offended. I'm very offended, and I dare say you will have offended the vast majority of people watching that you have just called 
our audience, what was it, prejudiced but, and all of that. So, I mean, that's a remarkable, so it's a remarkable sort of yeah, I, just, it, I mean, it, that doesn't sound like very inclusive, Bill. Well, why, why do we shame men, white men, for being white men? This, oh, no, please. this is something I've heard since I was young. You know, what is wrong with being a straight white man? What's the problem with that? The, why do we automatically assume that they're sexist? And then we wonder why male suicide is through the roof. But because on. we shame them just for being men. No, that's complete so, nonsense. I mean, first of all, because you don't believe that women deserve the right to vote. That's correct. That's true. Right. Do you believe they should work? I, I don't have a problem with women working. Right. Okay. And very that, progressive of you. And that's, so and just that's to put this in context, the, the person that says that we don't need the... diversity and inclusion <laughs> explicitly agrees with exclusion. You believe that women aren't capable no, to no, vote. I'll, I'll tell you. Do you want to know why I don't think women should vote, or do you, are you just I trying think we to all do now? Yeah. So, so the reason I don't think women should vote is because we don't do the infrastructure jobs. We don't pay taxes. We're a net tax loss. Well, you might and not so, be paying taxes, but I feel like and, HMRC and so, might be on their so, newly so newly returned helpline. As a group, look it up. We're not. And so my, my thing is, if you want to vote, you have to have some skin in the game. And right now, women are not doing the infrastructure jobs. We're not contributing to society oh. as a whole. And, and there we have it. Hang on. No, there Tom, we have it. Comes, it. There we have it. Oh, my argument in a nutshell. Hang on. You made my argument for me. What percent of infrastructure jobs do you think women do? Uh, well, it doesn't matter. You told, I'm going to take you at your word that women are underrepresented in groups like infrastructure, that they still don't earn as much, and hence that's why they don't pay as much. Hang on a minute. You need to let me finish. Because we don't want to do it. Hang on a minute. Let me make my argument. You just said that there are fewer women in, in jobs like infrastructure we don't want to that do you it. don't earn as much. OK, and that is because there is institutional prejudice on, that is Benjamin, making it difficult Benjamin. for okay, to get why, there. Then and why, that's why you need why, diversity and inclusion why, officers. Then why, Thank you, then Pearl, why, for making my argument. Why are women picking to major okay. in engineering? Why are pi women picking to go to okay. trade schools when we get to because choose? Because they are raised being told to that those are jobs choice. for the blokes. That's not true. Since I was a kid... No, that's not true, because since I was a kid, I've had so much women's empowerment. We There is nothing in society... It really didn't work, did it? <laughs> Let's put a pause in it. I will politely push back, Benjamin, that I do not think it is institutional sexism that stops women wanting to be scaffolders. Of course it is. Oh, no, of course it is. Me, no, because that. don't tell me... <laughs> hang on, don't tell me that, uh, you know, a woman is, is less capable of being a scaffolder no, so no, or that a bloke is less capable of being a nurse. It is sexist attitudes that create those roles, oh, right? Oh, oh, what, why do you think there aren't many male nurses? Do you think men are not capable of being a nurse? No, it's there because they're told of sexist or, 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 prejudices. Let me ask a different question. Let me change track and get away from the, uh, the, the, the female side of it. I would like to ask you, to start with you, Benjamin, if all of this diversity and inclusion uh, is such a good thing in major institutions like our NHS, so they're spending something like 13 billion quid on it all, why on earth is the NHS such an absolute shower. Why are our local councils all going bankrupt, all of this stuff? If diversity and inclusion was leading to better people being right at the top of it and running them well, why on earth are we in this situation? Well, the fact that the NHS is in a problem is because of the government that we've been chosen, which is largely elected by old, straight, white people. Who's leading so the government? So, quite frankly, I think that's shows an it? issue. Uh, Rishi Sunak. And I think what's been evident from the racist funders of the Tory party in recent weeks, that's hardly a great example of diversity and inclusion. Do, do you think that there's been positives, Pearl, of, you know, empowerment for... Um, ethnic groups, etc. We've seen things like positive action, I suppose we would call it. Do you think there's been a net benefit to that at all? I think that the best people for jobs should get the jobs. I don't believe in any of these empowerment programs. I don't believe in any of these handouts. I think it's as simple as that. Okay. The fact is that, you know, I was speaking to a lawyer recently who's, who's middle-aged now and he's a, a gay man and this person was saying about how when they were starting out in law, they didn't feel like they could be their full selves, their career didn't progress as much because it was very homophobic oh, at the time maybe, they were maybe starting they out. Just and so, talented. Do you know what? Do you, have, they just do you ever let talented. a man speak, Pearl? <laughs> Honest to God. And the fact is that, you know, you get so many examples of that. Don't tell me that a generation ago there were not black people intellectual and capable enough so, of running big businesses. The fact that they were the fact that many women weren't, far fewer, isn't because women weren't capable or those other minorities weren't capable. It's because there was a prejudice stopping the opportunity. But then why and are, this why is about are overcoming it. Final words, Final words, Then why aren't we doing it now? This, this is the thing. You can't, you can't push people into industries that don't want to do but it. But you push women, them women, away. Women, That's women what happens women now. Women don't want to be... Yeah, yeah let, let a woman speak. Come on, you sexist. <laughs> come on, come on. So it's... it's we don't want to be bricklayers. We don't want to be plumbers. We're not picking these jobs. It's nothing to do with 
It's nothing to do with our sex. It's the industries right, that frankly, we pick. We should all, all right. want to be plumbers. They're earning more than the rest of us. OK. All right. Well, <laughs> that was lively. All right. Well, who do you agree with? Thank you very much, by the way. That was wonderful. Um, as Kemi Badenoch reveals that equality, diversity and inclusion training is having little to no impact, has the relentless focus on the subject been bad for Britain? Sandra on X says... Diversity and inclusion policies are in reality incredibly divisive. A badge for a day or a flag for a week causes more harm than good. Lee says equality, diversity and inclusion training has no place in any well-oiled business. Sarah says diversity and inclusion training can help, but true progress comes from having good mentors to learn from. Mentors from a variety of different backgrounds and experiences. Your verdict is now in. 96% of you agree <laughs> that the relentless focus on diversity and inclusion training has been bad for Britain. 4% of you say that it has not. Right, coming up, a migrant is stabbed crossing the channel on a small boat to England. Just what sort of dangerous criminals could we be importing to the UK? But next, Rishi Sunaki met with the 1922 Backbench Committee after a so-called flurry of no-confidence letters have been submitted against him. Half the Cabinet supposedly want his job. Is he safe? Former Deputy Chair of the Tory party, Lee Anderson, has exclusive insight on the drama, and you will never believe the response that he got to this question today from, well, a woke fire rescue boss. Unfair advantages white people have in your force. All will be revealed. Stay tuned. Evening. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Most of England and Wales will be dry and bright after a bit of a dull start. Scotland and Northern Ireland turning wet and increasingly windy tomorrow thanks to this weather system approaching from the Atlantic. We've had this set of weather fronts sitting across us today, made for a pretty damp day for parts of England and Wales. Still a few heavy showers around through the evening, but tending to clear away, most becoming dry through the night until that next band of rain makes for a damp start over the highlands and the west of Northern Ireland on Thursday morning. Could be quite murky across the south tomorrow as well. A lot of mist, a low cloud settling in through the night. So don't be surprised if it's not a little drab first thing on Thursday morning. Could even be some fog patches around. It should steadily clear through the morning. And then most of England and Wales dry and bright. A bit of patchy rain could affect North Wales, Northern England at times, certainly wet in Western Scotland. That rain moving from west to east across Northern Ireland to brightening up perhaps across the far northwest, but it will be windy here, blustery conditions throughout and turning a little colder. Elsewhere, still pretty mild with a bit of brightness in the south. We could easily see those temperatures into the mid-teens once more. We will see the rain trickling further south as we go through the night. Uh, a damp start across parts of the south, that rain perhaps lingering until lunchtime across the southeast. Blustery showers coming in behind, particularly for Scotland and Northern Ireland with some snow on the hills and a colder feel. It is going to turn chillier for all of us to end this week into the weekend. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 p.m. Our first question comes from Elliot. Elliot, hello. Is, is Canada now an authoritarian state? Elliot, I think it's been an authoritarian state for a while. I mean, uh, under Trudeau, this is a new thing now. And this is coming from the Justice Minister, uh, who has Arif Virani. And he has defended this new power for their online harms bill. That sounds familiar. We've got something quite similar. And they're saying they can now impose house arrest on someone who they think might commit a hate crime in the future, right? That's scary stuff, isn't it? There's obviously a very dark side to this, because you can't, or you sh in my opinion, you shouldn't be able to imprison somebody before they've done anything. Right. Well, it is Canada. Well. And, <laughs> and uh, I know you, you in this country, you kind of kind of respect Canada as a country. America didn't even know it was a country until recently. <laughs> and I think that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to, to show themselves to be different than America. I think America has a responsibility to, to invade. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> I do. You know, you're, you're kidding, but it may come down to this. It's, or this may just be a, pr a Right. Yeah, maybe. Well, I just think it's ridiculous that the idea yeah. of arresting someone... I mean, our government's yeah. bad enough, and the Scottish government's out of control, the Irish government's right. out of control. They're all talking about... I mean, the Irish government's got a new hate crimes bill where they're talking about they can seize your phone if they suspect you might have some material that could potentially yeah. stir up hatred. I mean, for God's sake, what does that mean? Your phone's full of that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, well, <laughs> the government knows that. Yeah. But, um, but the, you're, you're right, but it has to do with a bigger picture, which is Canada has sucked itself in on the big team world. So, sorry, I'm going to say it. It's big team world. And what they're, what they're doing, this is not even a free speech issue. This is just about silencing 
uh, dissent well, against the Canadian government. It has nothing to do with openness and talk, whatever. It's like saying, we don't want these people to spread their you opinions, know, opinions. Dangerous opinions. That's what speech codes and hate speech laws always do. This is my it's ex-missus ordered a pizza night, on Deliveroo. Only on TV News. Now, coming in, and, um, I am joined by the man the who had his thumb bitten talk. off by a delivery rider. But first, after his defection to Reform UK last week, Lee Anderson was back in Parliament today grilling the chair of Dorset and Wilshire Fire and Rescue Authority, Rebecca Knox, after she claimed that her force, her own force, was institutionally racist. It's fair to say Lee's questioning left her in a bit of a muddle. Fair advantages white people have in your force? I would hope not none. Not advantages. Did I hear you? Yeah, do they correctly? have any advantages? No. So then how can you be institutionally racist? Um, I, 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 sorry, I, I, might, I might have to get back to you. No, um, no, you no. don't. Yeah, I'm joined now by the man himself, Lee Anderson. So, Lee, this fire force declared itself institutionally racist, essentially. Yeah. It, and then when you said, what makes you institutionally racist, there, there weren't actually any answers, were there? I think this is just a case, Patrick, of a, of a boss here just ticking a box, admitting that the, the force is institutionally racist when it's probably not, just to keep a job. It was quite pathetic. You know, I, I challenged her, I grilled her on the spot in the Home Affairs Select Committee today, and she couldn't answer a simple question. It totally flummoxed her. Uh, why they're doing this is, again, it's virtue signalling at the highest level. Well, it is literally at the highest level, though. To declare, be willing to declare yourselves institutionally racist, for most people, would be yeah. the worst thing imaginable. You would yeah. try to avoid that at all costs. Yeah. They've willingly done this and then not got any evidence to back it up, which is, just doesn't make any but sense. But the thing is, Patrick, she's the boss of this fire service, of this fire authority. Mm. She's admitted in a Home Affairs Select Committee that her force is institutionally racist and then, like you say, cannot back it up with any evidence. She's just ticking boxes to keep a job, as far as I'm concerned. So you, you honestly think that we're in a situation in Britain at the moment where companies and corporations and, indeed, public bodies like that are deliberately saying that they're institutionally yeah. racist? As Absolutely. All... It's almost as if, Patrick, it's fashionable to say that you're racist. It's pathetic. I just find that absolutely bizarre. It's staggering. Uh... Is she going to come back to you with any examples at some point? Do you well, think? I, I, I doubt it very much, Patrick. I mean, I mean, the whole session was. I mean, if you watched further on in the clips uh, of this of this lady today, she was absolutely pathetic. Um, like I say, it's virtue signalling at the highest level. Mm. Definitely doing it to keep a job, in my humble opinion. I just find it absolutely bonkers. Most people would it's go, crazy. you know, to hell and high water to, to be desperate to not be seen to be. Racist, like yes. institutionally racist, yeah. and yet there you are admitting it and hoping that the mob go away and shock or they go. don't go away. Go. Anyway, after a week of fevered plotting, intense speculation about leadership challenges, Rishi Sunak faced the gauntlet of PMQs earlier today, and he certainly wasn't given an easy ride. You can see why he doesn't want an election. Yeah. Why his party have lost faith in him? Why half his cabinet are lining up to replace him? Yeah. No answers, no plan, no clue. Well, Sunak was then, yet again, hauled over the hot coals by the backbench 1922 committee this evening. Now, look, Lee, you are the former Tory deputy party chairman. You've been in the room at these meetings before. You were the red wall made flesh. People <laughs> used to want you to turn up at their Conservative associations and bang the drum. So you really know what people are saying about Sunak, all right? Now you're finally switched party, you can reveal the truth right here on this show. It's, what it's not a matter of re revealing the truth, Patrick, is that uh, the Parliamentary Conservative Party, and I've got many, many friends in there, so I'm, I'm not here to, to, to diss them or slag them off, but uh, it, it is a fact that the Parliamentary Party are probably out of touch with the Conservative membership and the vast majority of Conservative voters in this great country of ours, out of touch, Parliament's out of touch, we know that. And we keep hearing the same thing, stick to the plan, stick to the plan, the plan's working. This is the plan that's put the Conservative Party 20, 25 points behind in the polls. The plan's not well, working. Well, you know what happens at these 1922 committee meetings, Lee? And, you know, all too often I got the impression that you had to come out of those and go, oh, you know what, it won't I stopped well. going to them, Patrick, because uh -huh. I thought it was just a waste of time. It's a lot of people, no disrespect to my colleagues, but they're going there and they're blowing smoke up a certain part of an anatomy of the Prime Minister, making him feel good when actually what he needs to be told 
is the truth. And unfortunately, a lot of my colleagues don't tell them. Do you think they're, do you think they're lying? To, so you think Tory MPs and presumably cabinet ministers are lying to the prime minister about what the mood is actually like about him? I said last year, Patrick, that certain parts of the Conservative Party are like the, the band on the Titanic. They sit there playing the same old song. They can see what's coming, but right. do nothing about it. All right, well, I'll tell you what. Um, we are now going to be talking about another record-breaking day for small boats, yeah. OK? 450 migrant arrivals on UK shores today alone. That's the highest number to arrive in a single day this year. Meanwhile, over in the House of Lords... Aha! Oh, look at him. There we go. The health minister we never had. <laughs> uh, rebel peers have this evening done their level best to delay the government's Rwanda bill by backing seven amendments. It means that flights to Rwanda won't now take off until, we think, maybe June. Lee... Have Sunak's chances of getting flights off the ground by spring vanished? Uh, probably, Patrick. Look, I mean, I, I spoke to colleagues earlier today. I think the, there's going to be thousands of young men landing on these shores all throughout the summer this year. This is not a, boat, uh, a vote winner at all. We had the chance last year, you know, when the first... Well, it's, it's longer than a year ago now, actually, Patrick. When that first Rwanda flight was on the tarmac ready to go, we should have just sent it. This nonsense will have stopped by now. I'm going to be talking in a few minutes' time about one Channel migrant was stabbed, apparently, on a small boat crossing the Channel today. Yeah. And it is the latest in a long line of issues that we've had. Yeah. Do you think more needs to be made of the idea that we might be importing violent thugs? Patrick, I've said this for the last three and a half years. We are importing young men. We don't know where they're from, what the background is. They could be, you know, potential terrorists, thugs. Why are they carrying knives on Dingus well, yeah. country? That's the question. Well, Why are they carrying knives? As far as we can gather today, of this record-breaking day, it looks like at least one of those people that we've imported today is uh, potentially an attempted murderer. Yeah. Is certainly armed with a knife, from what the reports are saying. But we've had some of these um, migrants before, Patrick, come over and commit horrific sex crimes and murders. Mm. You know, we... I've said it time and time again, we're giving right. this country away to a, a, a third-world culture, if you like. They've come here, they've got no respect for our country at all, and they're just roaming loose in our communities and causing all obviously, sorts of mayhem. Look, obviously, there's a huge amount of pushback to that. People say they're all fleeing war and that they there's aren't no need our help, Patrick. et cetera, so. There is no war in France. Mm. That, that was Reform UK MP Lee Anderson. Thank you very, very much. Coming up, yes, as we were just talking about, an illegal migrant arrives on a small boat to England and they are immediately whisked away on an ambulance with stab wounds. So, should we be concerned about violence being imported to Britain? Also on the way. New figures reveal that one in five Muslim prisoners in England and Wales is white, amid growing fears that Islamist gangs are behind a surge in conversions. Convert or get hurt. It's claimed some jails even have their own Sharia societies. But next, the dangers of the gig economy. I speak to the man who had his thumb bitten off by a rabid delivery rider gone rogue. Stephen Jenkinson, whose life was turned upside down by the gruesome attack, joins me live, and that's next. Headliners. Tomorrow's papers tonight, every night from 11 p.m. Is a debate on gender really a far right issue? Far right. I'm so bored of that phrase. You know what I mean? Like anyone who talks about anyone who acknowledges that there are two sexes is suddenly far right because that's what that's what Hitler and Mussolini were all about. Um, this, this question from Shirley is of course about Labour. They've been accused of being undemocratic because they pressured a pub into cancelling a debate, and this debate features Kelly J. Keane, who's been on this show a couple of times, uh, and she's a campaigner, and she was just on the panel, and then they got a letter saying that they couldn't do it because Kelly J. Keane apparently attracts far-right groups. Now, they've tried this trick before, but because some awful, ghastly neo-Nazi types turned up near to an event that she was holding in Australia, they kind of tried to blame that on her and suggest that the two were the same thing. They weren't. That was an opportunistic group turning up to... They're not... Neo-Nazis aren't pro-feminist. <laughs> they're, they're not pro an event called Let Women Speak. That's just ridiculous. <laughs> New Zealand's uh, TV uh, blurred her uh, touching her zip because they said that her touching her zip was a far-right uh, dog whistle because she's, she's making that 
symbol. Yeah, but she, she wasn't making the symbol. Wow. She was just adjusting a zip. Yeah. And, and, all, and also, this isn't a far right symbol. And that's, that was incredible because she obviously wasn't making that symbol anyway. She was just adjusting a top. But this New Zealand uh, news channel blurred out the hand so that they could <laughs> pretend that it was some horrible ghastly. Yeah. I mean, well, she's, she's, just, to us, we, she's talked about having voted Labour in the past. She's yeah. so not far right. But also, I mean, even if she were right wing, which she yes. isn't, why would they be banning a panel where there's a discussion about an, one of the most important issues of our day? What well, are Labour playing at here? they're anti-democratic, aren't they? They're just kind of playing whack-a-mole with things they don't like. I think yeah. maybe I'll write to the pub and say, I do want to see Kelly J. Keane there. Yeah, but it's... they won't listen to you well, if you no, say they that, won't. will they? Because you've got the unfashionable opinion, Chris. Well, I'm the unfashionable workplace. <laughs> GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other, which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Welcome back to Pantry and Christie's tonight. Now, coming up, after a small boat migrant arrives at Dover with stab wounds, have we imported foreign criminals to the UK? But first, I speak to the victim who had his thumb bitten clean off by a Deliveroo rider. It was just 10 days before Christmas, and what began as a normal Saturday night takeaway for Stephen Jenkinson ended in a vicious roadside attack. The 36-year-old had ordered a pizza, which arrived at the wrong location. A brief argument with the delivery girl then ensued before she chewed off his thumb like a savage. Well, Jennifer Rocher has now pleaded guilty to causing grievous bodily harm and could face jail when sentenced in May. What makes matters worse, though, is that she was not actually employed by Deliveroo, but had been working as a substitute rider using someone else's account. Stephen, meanwhile, well, life has never been the same since. He joins me now. Stephen, thank you very, very much. What happened? Well, so I'd just got gone back to work after paternity leave, uh, having my daughter, and I said to my ex-partner, you know, should we order some food? As you do, you know, you, there's no food in the house, you've got a brand new baby. And so she ordered a pizza on delivery. Mm. And I went through the process of, you know, ordering the food, waited for the driver to come. As most know, on a delivery app, it sends you a notification to say the, the rider has arrived. So I went to the front door, opened the front door, no one was there. Went back to Jessica, I said, there's no one there. Can you just send her a message and find out where she is? So she sent her a message, instantly replied saying, at location of PIN. Mm. So I walked back to the front door, opened the front door, nobody there. Went back inside, I said, she's not there. Can I just see on the phone where she actually is? Now, there was a pin on the, on, on the app yeah. that was about 50 metres up the road. So I made the decision to just go and get the food. Yeah. So as you would, it's 7.30 on a cold December night. You just want to eat, you don't want to go to bed. Um, walked up the road. As I got there, she, uh, she was standing off her bike. I said to her, I'm from that house, can I have the food, please? And she just launched an attack on me. Um, and as she started to swing punches for me, I just put my arm out like that yeah. to keep her at a distance because the only thought that went through my head at the time was, this is a girl, you're a guy. If you hit her in, or try and do anything in any way, you're yeah. going to get in a lot more trouble than she is. So I kept putting myself at a distance from her, saying, I'm going to call the police, I'm going to call the police. It's just unfortunate. As I went like that, the last time that I did it, my hand hit her helmet, my mm -hmm. thumb went through the visor, in, on the helmet, and she just clamped down until she bit it off. Um, Can we just have a, a look, if you don't mind? So it's that camera there is opposite you. So that is now your thumb, right? Yeah, so that's half my big toe. Um, 
So when I went to the hospital... Just keep it up for us. Is that all right? Sorry. Yeah, just, yeah, just, sure. just as you talk through it. So that is actually a bit of your big toe. Yeah, so that's the inside of my big toe. So if you look at a big toe, they've now removed the inside of it. So I've just got the outer side of my big toe. Goodness me. You, to be honest with you, you know, unless you really know, you can't tell. So it's, I mean, it's clearly not ideal. You've lost a bit of your big toe and, you know, you've now got a slightly different thumb. But yep. um, so what... Like, did it feel like? Did you realise what she was doing? Because it must have just been one of the most outrageous things you've ever had. I would say it was in her mouth for a good 45 seconds to a minute, you know. It, I was there shaking on her helmet to try and get her she off for a while. She's just chewing down on your thumb. And as she's biting and clamping and clamping and clamping, and all I remember is my hand dropped and my oh. brain said, she's let go. And then I lifted my arm up and clearly... and sprayed her with blood because there's an artery in your thumb. Oh my so I sprayed God. her with blood and then realised that half my thumb was missing. Uh, th there's, there's different layers to this story. Again, so your life, unfortunately, hasn't been the same since, and, and not just because of your thumb. No, absolutely. I've lost everything because of it. You know, I haven't worked. You know, by trade, I'm a plumber and a gas engineer. Um, I haven't worked. You know, my, me and my partner have now separated. You know, I don't get to see her or my daughter. You know, it's... it's um, it's tough, you know, in terms of debt, because I haven't been... I've been out of work for so long. You know, that's... It's a significant sum of money. Um, and Deliverer basically saying, it's not our problem. And, and this is an important point, because they... I mean, she wasn't a Deliveroo driver, was she? So she borrowed... She had her husband's account. Mm. Um, so she wasn't a Deliveroo rider... A registered Deliveroo rider, so Deliveroo had obviously didn't know that she was she was working that night. She thought it was the husband actually doing the jobs. Um, so... And this from is a, a big problem, isn't it? Because, you know, anyone can turn up at your front door, essentially, including, in your case, at least someone who was willing to bite your thumb off. Absolutely. And, you know, there are so many different assault cases, sexual assault cases against delivery riders. Um, there was a case recently where a woman was getting stalked by a delivery rider who was a third party again. Now... That all needs to change, you know. The law needs to change, reform needs to happen. We have the technology to be able to do so in terms of face ID on your phone. You open your phone with your face, you know, in the same way you should be doing that with picking up food, right? So I am Joe Bloggs, I am picking up the food. I am Joe Bloggs, I've been, you know, I've had all the relevant police checks yeah. and I'm the one delivering the food. So you know that that person has gone through such a stringent process just to be able to have that position, yeah. to be picking up your food and dropping it off. And, and do you think, I mean, do you think that you might be able to go back to work soon as a result? I know it's a very, you know, it's a, literally a hands-on job, isn't it? From a physical point, it's tough because, for example, things like buttons even, shoelaces, they're so difficult for me these days. So, you know, the amount of times I've tried to do things with copper pipe, with fittings and everything else, because I don't have a lot of feeling and it is a lot more bulky than my original thumb... Yeah. It's hard to hold then, those fittings in and just, place. Just quickly, sorry to ask you this, but I think be, why couldn't they just reattach your thumb? So when she had bitten my thumb off, in the time that my ex-partner got out so she could spit it, spit it into her hand, mm. she'd had a good chew on it, oh she'd sucked God. all the blood out of it and she'd had a real, um, oh. real go on it. So when it got taken to hospital, oh. they said, there's no way that this can go back on. You can see all, all the right. bite marks. Well, look, thank you very much for coming in and for talking to us about it. And hopefully you've highlighted an issue there that gets sorted, when, certainly when it comes to delivery drivers. And hopefully you get justice as well for what's happened to you. In a statement, Deliveroo said its riders were self-employed, a fact which has been confirmed by UK courts on multiple occasions. They added substitution uh, is and always has been a common feature of self-employment. It's not specific to Deliveroo nor our sector, the Department for Work and Pensions. They also said they couldn't comment on an active case, even though she's pleaded guilty, apparently. They are yet to comment on the general issue of substitution. So, unfortunately for you, at the moment, it looks like you've got a real file on your hands, Stephen. But thank you very much for coming in. It is much, much appreciated. Look, coming up, damning new figures reveal that one in five Muslim prisoners in England and Wales is white amid growing fears that gangs behind bars are surging in conversions. Now, it's been claimed that some jails have their Sharia societies. Former government advisor Colin Bloom has seen it all in jails. I'm very pleased to say he joins me live shortly. But next, a migrant is stabbed as they cross the channel on a small boat to England. Just what sort of people are on their way here? It's Patrick Christie tonight. We're on GB News. But right now, it is, of course, your weather with Alex Deakin. feeling in 
Inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Evening, welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Most of England and Wales will be dry and bright after a bit of a dull start. Scotland and Northern Ireland turning wet and increasingly windy tomorrow thanks to this weather system approaching from the Atlantic. We've had this set of weather fronts sitting across us today, made for a pretty damp day for parts of England and Wales. Still a few heavy showers around through the evening, but tending to clear away, most becoming dry through the night until that next band of rain makes for a damp start over the highlands and the west of Northern Ireland on Thursday morning. Could be quite murky across the south tomorrow as well. A lot of mist, a low cloud settling in through the night. So don't be surprised if it's not a little drab first thing on Thursday morning. Could even be some fog patches around. It should steadily clear through the morning. And then most of England and Wales dry and bright. A bit of patchy rain could affect North Wales, Northern England at times, certainly wet in Western Scotland. That rain moving from west to east across Northern Ireland to brightening up perhaps across the far northwest. But it will be windy here, blustery conditions throughout and turning a little colder. Elsewhere, still pretty mild with a bit of brightness in the south. We could easily see those temperatures into the mid-teens once more. We will see the rain trickling further south as we go through the night. Uh, a damp start across parts of the south. That rain perhaps lingering until lunchtime across the southeast. Blustery showers coming in behind, particularly for Scotland and Northern Ireland with some snow on the hills and a colder feel. It is going to turn chillier for all of us to end this week into the weekend. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Time is ticking on your chance to win the Great British Giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner just like Phil. Didn't quite believe it and still can't. Uh, and if I can win it, anybody can win it. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. It's 10 p.m. I'm Patrick Christie's. Tonight, a channel migrant stabbed on a boat. We're importing violent thugs like these. Yeah. 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 And it's costing you billions. Also, convert or get hurt. We lift the lid on Muslim prison gangs and. Free, free! Woke students go feral at a university. I've got tomorrow's newspaper front pages tonight with director of popular conservatives Mark Littlewood, businessman and activist Adam Brooks, and author Rebecca Reed. Oh, and what's wrong with the New England badge? Looks like an own goal to me. Can you tell what's up with it? Get ready, Britain. Here we go. We are importing armed, violent thugs. Next.
Good evening. The top stories from the GB newsroom tonight. An illegal migrant is in hospital this evening after being stabbed on board a small boat attempting to cross the English Channel. UK border force and two lifeboats attended the scene just before lunchtime today. Officers are currently trying to establish what happened. The victim, we understand, has non-life-threatening injuries. But the dinghy was one of eight small boats that reached UK shores on the busiest day of channel crossing so far this year, with a record 450 migrants arriving today. This takes the number of migrants coming to the UK illegally this year to nearly 4,000. Meanwhile, passage of the government's flagship Rwanda bill is now delayed until after Easter when MPs will have to vote again after several votes against it by the House of Lords today. Our political editor, Chris Hope, has the latest. In the House of Lords tonight, peers have voted to say that migrants can only be sent to Rwanda when all the measures in the Rwanda Treaty have been satisfied, and that could take a while. Another amendment passed by the, by the peers here says the bill must have due regard for international law. And so the ping-pong process continues, but the government is very clear it will ensure, it will try and force this measure through Parliament to ensure that flights can take off. It rolls on now, probably till after Easter, when we expect another battle between the Commons and the Lords. Now, housing illegal migrants on barges, military bases and in student accommodation will cost taxpayers more than the hotels that are currently being used. The National Audit Office says housing those waiting for asylum decisions in alternative accommodation would cost the Home Office £46 million more than just using hotels. Meanwhile, the Home Office has announced that 100 asylum hotels will have been handed back to public use by the end of March. To Wales now, where Vaughan Gessing has been sworn in as First Minister this evening. The new Welsh Labour leader succeeds Mark Drakeford, who resigned yesterday after holding the position since 2018. Mr Gessing was elected as the Welsh Government leader by members of the Senate earlier on today. He's expected to form a new cabinet in the next few days. Earlier on, he told the Senate he wants to lead a Wales of hope, ambition and unity. Now, some Greg's the Baker stores were forced to close today after being hit by an IT glitch at the tills. Some shops put up temporary close notices on their doors after they were unable to accept payments. The bakery chain asked customers to place orders outside using the Greg's mobile app before food could be given to them. Well, tonight, Greg's have said they've resolved their technical issues and shops will be open as usual tomorrow. The disruption follows similar IT glitches at Sainsbury's, Tesco's and McDonald's last week. And HMRC has reversed a decision to close its self-assessment telephone helpline for half of the year. The tax authority originally announced the line would be closed between April and September, with taxpayers directed to online services instead. MPs criticised the U-turn. That's the news. For the latest stories, do sign up to GB News Alerts. Scan that QR code on your screen right now or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Welcome along. Is the Channel migrant crisis importing violent thugs into Britain? Today was a record-breaking day, 450 arrivals. One of those arrivals was stabbed whilst on a boat crossing the Channel. GB News filmed the scene as an ambulance arrived at the harbour to meet the lifeboat. So, it looks like at least one of the people we've imported into Britain today is probably prepared to kill somebody. Brilliant. Fortunately, the stab victim's injuries are not believed to be life-threatening. But we are clearly now importing Channel migrants who have armed themselves. As we know, we probably won't be able to deport that person, even if we find out who it is. And today, just hours ago, the members of the House of Lords voted against the Rwanda plan. Again, they want to tighten safeguards for Channel migrants. What about the safeguards for us? We know violent thugs have come across the channel. Two channel migrants who attacked police on a French beach were jailed. The pair were part of a violent mob who confronted police, threw missiles at them, tried to beat them up. Sally Taib Abdullah and Ahmed Omar Sali Keita were sentenced at Canterbury Crown Court to a total of two years and two months imprisonment for attempting to arrive in the UK illegally. Again, they probably won't be deported. 
We know we're importing hardened criminals trained in violence by trafficking gangs. And that is before I mention the sexual violence that several Channel migrants have been accused of. Today, as well, GB News revealed that the cost to the British taxpayer for large-scale asylum housing will be £1.2 billion. That's apparently £46 million more than expected and, frankly, £1.2 billion more than it should be. The Prime Minister promised to end the use of migrant hotels. That meant redeveloping large military sites. By the end of this month, it looks like the Home Office will have spent at least 230 million quid on RAF Scampton and other sites. There's a tragic metaphor here, isn't there? We haven't got any money to increase defence spending. At the same time, we're spending hundreds of millions of pounds packing former military sites with fighting age males from other countries who entered Britain illegally. The Wethersfield base was originally expected to cost £5 million. That's come in at £49 million. We know that Channel migrants are not bothered about Rwanda. They are laughing at us. In Rwanda and the people here in the camps just laugh. It's become a bit of a joke. The threat hasn't put them off because no one here thinks for a second they're heading back to Rwanda if they make it to the UK. Despite the blatant facts, James Cleverley was very vocal about how he'd stop the boats over Christmas, wasn't he? Well done. There he is. Today, we've had a record for arrivals this year. One of them is clearly a knife-wielding lunatic, and the French are just ushering them through. These Channel migrants do not have to pay human traffickers to come to Britain. They could save themselves thousands of pounds by getting on a flight and claiming asylum when they land here. They want to be undocumented, so we don't know who they are and what they've done in the past. And given that someone was stabbed on a boat today, it's not hard to see why. Let's get the thoughts now of my panel. I'm joined this evening by the director of Popular Conservatives, Mark Littlewood. I've got businessman and activist Adam Brooks. And I've also got author and journalist Rebecca Reid. Mark, are we importing foreign thugs? Well, I'm not sure we're importing them. Importing suggests that you kind of, you know, you pay some money and buy something. I import are they some stuff. Over? They are definitely, they're definitely coming over. It's a mixed bag. Not all of them are that, but some of them are that, as you've pointed out. And the problem here, look, it's quite difficult for the UK to secure all of its border. We've got, what is it, 11,000 miles of coastline. Uh, I mean, you'd need sort of a million people to be the Coast mm. Guard to prevent everybody getting in. The problem is the lack of deterrent effect and the slowness of the process when you've made it. It is taking more than six months, in most cases, to process asylum claims. A remarkable number, at first instance, seem to be successful. We should be able to process these things in, I don't know, Maybe two or three days is a bit optimistic, but something along those lines. And we need to deport people quickly. If you can get that part of it right, then mm. the demand slows. Well, look, Adam, today we had a record-breaking day for the year. 450 people arrived. At least one of those, it appears, is willing to take a knife to another human being. Concerning. Look, we've got people coming from cultures that are very different from our own. You know, um, this is dangerous. We've had terrorists, gangsters, paedophiles, rapists... Now we've just got people that are stabbing people on their way here. I mean, as a parent, we've got enough nutters in this country as it is. I don't want more. And as a taxpayer, I don't want to be funding their life mm. on benefits, their free health care, their housing. Where are we going to get the houses from? 450 today. They're going to want their families over. That number will probably swell to about 1,500 once their families come over in the next two years. How can this go on? This is a national emergency. The Greeks started doing it. The Greek authorities started towing back or turning back boats. Mm. They were wrapped on the knuckles. What's happened to them? Nothing. Rishi Sunak needs to get some balls. If I was the Prime Minister, I'd be towing them back very safely, very slowly, okay. and I would take the consequences. It's our country. We can do what we want. All right, Rebecca, there were four stories rolled into one today. We've got yeah. the record arrivals, we've got the stabbing, uh, we've got the uh, Lords, and we've got the cost that's mm -hmm. emerged now as well, about £1.2 billion. Which one of those is the most egregious for you, do you think? So, when we talked about this today, when we were prepping for the show, mm. I decided that I was going to talk to a lefty lawyer mm. about what they thought we should do. Because we talk about the lefty lawyers all the time. Yep. So I spoke to one, and they said that, in their experience, the major issue is that when they try and process the forms, it is done by people who are often, his words were, straight off the checkout at Lidl. Like, they are junior people who have left school recently with very little training. A lot of them are tick boxes, and if your form goes in and the person who filled it out, who is on minimum wage, has filled it out incorrectly, one point, 
it gets put back. And every single time there's a human error in these forms, it starts again. So the processing is, is, is as you said, arduous and badly handled. So I'm starting to think that if this is a national emergency, and people in this country seem to agree with that, if we can up, if we can have the kind of responsibility to COVID, we go, OK, this is an emergency. So therefore, we need thousands more people doing processing. And mm. that needs to make, mean that anybody who is a legitimate asylum seeker can stay, and anybody right. who isn't goes back. The, the, uh, OK, fine, I get that. The, the issue is that we are in a situation at the moment where the individual who you know, may or may not be proven to have stabbed this individual on a boat, OK, as it currently stands in our law, we could, we could find that person guilty in this country of that crime, and if they are from essentially any other country other than somewhere in Western Europe, we still will not be able to send them back. But that's right, and it's tricky to send people back when they aren't really, you know, part of a, a coherent system. I do think that the, the burden should be on the asylum seeker themselves to fill out these forms. But not it on the, won't right? be because well, it, it benefits them to keep. If you, if I wanted yeah, to send this well, country, I'd do the out. form wrong every time. Yeah, yeah, but but, but you, you, that shouldn't be a free pass. Yeah, but the your, word your should. Your job is to get the form properly filled out. If you can't do that, then. It's not no. a proper claim. But you just said it's really important that we can't just send people... It's hard to send people yeah, back. Yeah, it is hard to send them back, but this is what you actually need to leave ECHR, I oh, think. But we, won't difficult... get, we won't get the Rwanda policy working properly. But you this lose... will be symbolic rather than anything else. But you We're lose a lot by leaving right. ECHR. Let's, 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 ECHR. Let's, let's just tell it as it is and the reality of our asylum seeker system. The um, acid attacker was twice denied asylum, I believe. Yep. He was found guilty of a sexual offence. He was then granted asylum yeah, to stay in this country. We are a joke. We are weak. And this is going to finish this country. But there is we are going to end up with probably a million channel migrants mm. in the next but five he was or from ten years. Right? And Their families are going to come over and our culture is going to be eroded. But there has to be a way that if you were a woman from Afghanistan who would, de who would well, actually be killed by the Taliban... Oh, no, uh, let me finish. Right. There, we have to be able to get the right people from Afghanistan, not men like that, nobody wants mm. him here, but the real, genuine people who need to be here must be able we to come here. These are people fleeing France, find, not fleeing Afghanistan, well, they're clearly, France. Yeah, and they're clearly on a boat with somebody who's a stabber, so it clearly it wasn't all jokes. In Calais. You, you don't Where need, do we you don't need to, you know, I'm not, I'm not Emmanuel Macron's biggest fan. I've never understood this argument. Because, why because, on, because you, have you, you seen what the conditions are like in Calais? If you or I were there, we'd be out like a shot. France, Neither of us would stay there by choice. You surely the way, have to treat France as safe haven, right? Safe, absolutely, yeah. but not pleasant, so not easy. There, you can't France work there, you can't make a life there. France Once you're there, you want to keep going. Within the next five years, we are going to have slums on the streets of Britain. There are already what, people living what, in active poverty in what, Britain. What enraged, what enraged me, I mean, many things to be fair, but what, one thing that enraged me today was, you know, as this news was breaking about the fact that, OK, someone had been stabbed on a migrant boat, which means that someone on that boat was bringing a knife into Britain, which is not the only time that we've seen that, actually. And having spoken to people who used to work in the Home Office as well, they've told me some utter horror stories that we can't report about some of the things that people have been bringing over on the Channel. Um, and it makes me seriously think, why are we doing this? And the House of Lords are then in there saying, oh, well, we'll just have to protect people's rights even more. It makes me wonder why we aren't protecting... It doesn't affect right, the rich. But... Okay. It, does. it affects right. the everyday person of this country. More so, the yeah. Lords right. do not see the higher streets uh, uh, and the hotels okay. in their areas. All right, a Home Office spokesperson said this. We have always been clear that the use of asylum hotels is unacceptable. I've read this out about five times. It's the same statement that they always send us. We've always been clear that the use of asylum hotels is unacceptable, and that's why we are acting swiftly to reduce the impact on local communities by moving asylum seekers onto barges and former military sites. But we have further to go, which is why we are passing the safety of Rwanda bill, deterring channel crossings and getting flights off to Rwanda, because it's only when people are discouraged from taking those journeys that we can end the hotel use for good. While the NAO's figures include setup costs, it is currently better value for money for the taxpayer to continue with these sites than use hotels. Now, coming up, <laughs> University of Bristol students are using tables and chairs to barricade themselves into campus buildings in a... Free, free, Palestine! More of that uh, when I reveal more of tomorrow's newspaper front pages. But next... Damning new figures reveal that one in five Muslim prisoners in England and Wales is white, amid growing fears that Islamist gangs are behind a surge in conversions. It's even claimed that some prisons now have their own Sharia societies. The author of a government report, Colin Bloom, joins me live. It's Patrick Christie tonight. We're on GB News.
headliners. Tomorrow's papers tonight, every night from 11 p.m. Welcome back to Headliners. And, Paul, we're going to get straight into Monday's mail for some good old-fashioned, traditional male breastfeeding. Yeah. Uh, to answer the question, what is the latest woke hell, Josh? Uh, Rao, as hospitals say, hormone-filled milk from trans women who were born male is just as good for a baby as the real thing. It's possible for men, if they pump themselves full of oestrogen, to grow larger breast tissue. And they often do... If or you just eat lots of burgers. Uh, yeah, or... Yeah. <laughs> Easy bit, eh? Um, but... And once you've done that, it is, it is actually then possible to express or lactate some... A liquid. A liquid, OK? If to that liquid you then add another load of pills, medication, chemicals, whatever, that lactation juice can be fed to a baby. We don't really... This is not for the sake of the baby. The baby has no benefits from this whatsoever. The studies are very weak on it. Um, it's a bit worrying because, you know, when ho hospitals started indulging in, in homeopathy and having, a, you know, the NHS had homeo yeah. homeopathic um, hospitals, that was worrying because they're supposed to be a trusted authority. And before saying something like this, there should be an awful lot of study done. I want to show you this hospital. This is necessary. The University yeah, Hospital Sussex NHS Foundation Trust. That's who it is. And they have written one of the stupidest sentences Sentences I have read on, aloud read in the two years that I've been <laughs> privileged to do the show. It says the term human milk is meant to be neutral and not gender biased. <laughs> yep. Wow. Yep. That's incredible. <laughs> yep. Oh my God, we're laughing at you. I mean, and as someone says here, babies are not props. And that's the yep. scary thing. And no. when it's not when we're not focusing primarily on the health of a baby. No, but the uh, the, the, the feeling of a person doing it yeah. rather than it's, it's a bit of an odd way to go, isn't it? So. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and, of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. All right, welcome back. The first of tomorrow's newspaper front page is coming up. But time now to dig into startling revelations that one in five Muslim prisoners is now white, sparking fears that Islamist gangs are behind a surge in forced conversions behind bars. Ministry of Justice data shows there were nearly 16,000 Muslim prisoners in England and Wales in September last year, accounting for 18% of all inmates. Crucially, nearly 20% of those inmates were whites. That's three times the rate of the general Muslim population. It follows a report two years ago by Jonathan Hall KC, the independent reviewer of terror legislation, that Muslim terrorists were setting up Sharia courts behind bars because prison staff were so concerned about being accused of racism. Millie Dowler murderer Levi Belfield and the Soham killer Ian Huntley have both notoriously converted to Islam in prison. And the Duke of Marlborough famously said he became Muslim in jail because apparently you get more food. But meanwhile, another review led last year by Colin Bloom, a government advisor, found that failure to identify as a Muslim meant that at best the new prisoner would be denied protection from violent Muslims. But there is a lot more to it than that. And here to discuss this, I'm joined by the man himself, the former government advisor, Colin Bloom. Thank you very much. Um, how bad is the problem of 
Islamist conversion. Now, I want to make that distinction, obviously, between Islam and Islamist conversion in prisons. And what does it really mean? Well, look, I want to s start by saying there is some very good practice in prisons and there are some very, very good chaplains. And in the work that I did for my review, I did identify some excellent practice. But there is also, uh, I think, fair to say that a number of uh, prisons, there are very large and aggressive uh, Islamist gangs, if you want to put it like that, um, uh, Muslim majority gangs, where they will, evidence was given to me in my review, where Qurans were put on the bed of incoming inmates um, with the very clear indication, convert or get hurt. And it was a, a way of coercing people to say, you know, if you want to be protected in prison, then you've got to convert and become part of our gang. Now, um, prisons are closed, high-pressure environments. Um, by nature, they're closed environments. Uh, uh, and you could imagine that a number, uh, you know, for, for very many people who are either susceptible to gang uh, culture or uh, are vulnerable in one way or another, will feel that pressure to convert. And in my report that was published last year, one of the very clear recommendations was that government uh, have an urgent inquiry into uh, an urgent review into this notion of forced conversions. Because not mm. only does it damage the human rights of the prisoners that are in there, um, but actually the consequences are that very many of them could become radicalised mm. and then we'll go Well, that's on my next question, really. How big, how, how big a problem is it for people going into the British system, prison system, and coming out more radical than they were when they went in, or radicalising others while they're in there? Well, I, look, honestly, I think the majority of people that are uh, so-called converted when they go into prison, they are doing it as a matter of convenience. Uh, convenience. And you mentioned... Uh, uh, Lee Rigby, it, the, the, the Duke Rigby, of Marlborough, sorry, was it, or Rigby, something? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, um, uh, you know, maybe that was just convenient. And, and I don't think that it was a genuine, clearly not a genuine uh, conversion. But for others who feel that there's maybe a sense of grievance, they've got some anger towards society, they are looking for an excuse to justify their, uh, you know, perhaps the reasons why they've been put in prison. Uh, at, Maybe for some of them, they want to change their life. They want to start again. Mm. This is a new beginning with a new faith. And they'll be very eager. And we know that for very many converts, particularly to converts to uh, uh, a particular form of Islamism, uh, that they become some of the worst mm. uh, extremists because they feel they've got something to... Well, I, I mentioned him there. I meant to uh, mention his killers, actually. Lee, Lee Rigby's killers, obviously. Yes. Some of the most notorious Islamists in the country uh, have been in prison uh, now for uh, quite some time. Uh, so they're in there. What about Sharia courts in prisons? What's going on there? Well, this, 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 again, it's part of that gang culture that does exist. And I think that whether it's the Ministry of Justice, whether it's individual uh, uh, prison chaplains or, uh, or the, the prison management, they do need to get a grip of that gang culture that, uh, that exists. Because there will be some people who, uh, for whatever reason, feel that they are going to get uh, either protected if they join a gang or they are going to get hurt if they don't uh, mm. join a gang. And that was some of the evidence that we received during the uh, evidence gathering process of my report was that for very many people, they felt under enormous pressure when they, when they went to prison. Now, if you're a prisoner, you go into prison, within 24 hours, you have a statutory right to be visited by the by some, one of the chaplains, one of the, uh, uh, either the, the managing chaplain or one of the supportive chaplains. Um, and we find that prisons are actually a much more religious place than the rest of society. More people have mm. a faith if they're in prison than, than not. But even by the standards of the most amazing, uh, you know, revivals, of religious uh, conversions, there is something going on in prisons because we are seeing the most incredible number of people converting, particularly to, uh, uh, to Islam, uh, in a way that is, defies logic. And I think one of the things that uh, we need to ensure that prison chaplains and uh, prison management have is that inquiring mind to say, just what the heck is going on here? You know, this, this doesn't seem right. 
and to perhaps have some professional cynicism as to exactly why it's going on and to help the prisoners that they've got from making big mistakes. Mm, OK. Well, look, thank you very, very much for, for coming on. Uh, we are out of time, unfortunately, now, but I would love to have you back on at some point in the very near future, actually, and continue this discussion, because I know it's an issue that myself, a lot of our viewers and listeners do care about uh, deeply. So that's, that's Colin Bloom there, who's the former government advisor. Uh, a Ministry of Justice spokesman said this, attributing these figures to the influence of Muslim gangs will be misleading and based on wholly anecdotal evidence. We do not tolerate forced religious conversions in prisons, and those found engaging in such behaviour face tough punishments. I imagine that might be quite refuted by Colin there. But anyway, coming up, uh, University of Bristol students use tablets and chairs to barricade themselves into campus in a pro-Palestine protest. Free, free, Palestine! More of that next, but first, I will have all of tomorrow's newspaper front pages in my press pack. Don't you dare move. Evening. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Most of England and Wales will be dry and bright after a bit of a dull start. Scotland and Northern Ireland turning wet and increasingly windy tomorrow thanks to this weather system approaching from the Atlantic. We've had this set of weather fronts sitting across us today, made for a pretty damp day for parts of England and Wales. Still a few heavy showers around through the evening, but tending to clear away, most becoming dry through the night until that next band of rain makes for a damp start over the highlands and the west of Northern Ireland on Thursday morning. Could be quite murky across the south tomorrow as well. A lot of mist, a low cloud settling in through the night. So don't be surprised if it's not a little drab first thing on Thursday morning. Could even be some fog patches around. It should steadily clear through the morning. And then most of England and Wales dry and bright. A bit of patchy rain could affect North Wales, Northern England at times, certainly wet in Western Scotland. That rain moving from west to east across Northern Ireland to brightening up perhaps across the far northwest, but it will be windy here, blustery conditions throughout and turning a little colder. Elsewhere, still pretty mild with a bit of brightness in the south. We could easily see those temperatures into the mid-teens once more. We will see the rain trickling further south as we go through the night. Uh, a damp start across parts of the south, that rain perhaps lingering until lunchtime across the southeast. Blustery showers coming in behind, particularly for Scotland and Northern Ireland with some snow on the hills and a colder feel. It is going to turn chillier for all of us to end this week into the weekend. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan, Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks, the admission's free. From 10 a.m. every Saturday, we want to make you think and we want to make you laugh. So we will give you all the top stories. Now we start with a story that has shocked the nation this week. But we're also going to make it light and fun and bring some entertainment in to make your Saturday morning nice and restful. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. This is Patrick Christie's Tonight on GB News. It's time to bring you a first look at tomorrow's front pages. Let's do it. OK, I've got the Metro first. So, guilty poisoner who watched victims die. The fentanyl phantom, they're calling him. Couples killer used 20 fake personas to help a two-year murder mission. He's described as the nerdy double killer who created a cast of 20 phantom characters during his two-year plot to poison a millionaire couple and steal their business. The Independent. Surprise inflation drop gives hope to homeowners. Mortgage lenders swift to cut borrowing as cost of food and eating 
out drives inflation to a three-year low. Well, there we go. Uh, let's whiz ourselves over now to the eye. UK on track for summer interest rate cuts after inflation falls. Bank of England expected to keep interest rates at 5.25%. So the economy leading the way on both the independent and the eye there. The Daily Telegraph. Mental health culture has gone too far, says Stride. Everyday anxiety is not a medical condition says Minister in crackdown on worklessness. There's another good story here on the front of the Telegraph, uh, which is MI6 chief quits Garrett Club amid sexism row. It is a uh, male-only club, the Garrett Club, one of many of them, and he's decided to suddenly quit because apparently for the first time ever in his life, he's realised that there's no women in there and that's a problem. Yeah, come on, mate. Anyway, uh, let's go to the Daily Mail. Mortgage hope as economy turns a corner at last. There we go. So, look, hey, it's the economy, stupid. They're going with it. Now, also, just here, the picture story on the front. Three staff at clinic are investigated over access to Kate's medical records. That was a story that first landed last night. We covered it at the time, so I think I'll leave that there for now. Right, uh, here, for my press pack, I am joined by the director at Popular Conservatives, Mark Littlewood, businessman and activist Adam Brooks, and author and journalist Rebecca Reid. Let's just have a little look here. I, I think the idiocy of The Telegraph's not their front page, but a story on it. MI6 chief quits Garrett Club amid sexism rouse. So the head of MI6 has quit the all-male Garrett Club after expressing concerns that his membership might undermine the intelligence agency's attempt to recruit more female spies. Mark, what tosh is this? Uh, uh, unbelievable tosh, isn't it? And as you say, Patrick, how has he only just reached this conclusion? Yeah. I don't know how long he's been a member for. If he joined under the misapprehension that it was uh, uh, that women were allowed, fair enough. But I guess he's been a member for some considerable time. I mean, I I'm a member of the Reform Club on Pall Mall, which does admit women. You said quite a lot of clubs don't admit women. I think it's down to only a few now, mm. a handful. Yeah, it's a very small number uh, now. But I don't actually particularly have a problem with it. I don't think I can join the Women's Institute. And nor should I be able to. Probably would be able to now. Uh, probably would be able to if I transitioned swiftly enough, yeah. Mm. But uh, I think it's perfectly fine for blokes to have a place where they congregate is with other just, blokes. Is this just the weak, pathetic... I mean, I no, don't think I want... It's signalling. Yeah, but I don't think I want someone running MI6 who... Who thinks this is the key part of national security. Yeah. Yeah, pretty weird. It's Pathetic. This this culture at the moment about saying something that makes you look virtuous and I'm such a nice guy. That's what he's after. It's a load of nonsense. What do you think as a woman? I think when we talk about sexism, this is so far down the list of things that I find problematic in terms of sexism because it's got like a handful of hundred members. Um, I don't love that there are clubs that don't accept women, but there are men who I love who are members of said clubs. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, the All Bright is an all women's club, and I think that all women's spaces are important. And I think probably to be consistent, if I want all women's spaces, yeah. and I do, you kind of have to tolerate so, all men's. Spaces. Yeah, yeah, oh uh, yeah. I and what, I, what I, women are going to want to go to a club like that anyway? I don't know. I yeah. do quite like. There's a couple that you do, that only just accept women, and I. Quite I quite like going there and being irritating because I no. like ruining more, their more day. Though, you being so irritating, <laughs> I'm not having that. I'm more worryingly, what sort of woman might be a brilliant British spy and say, well, I was going to devote my life being exactly. a British British oh, spy, well, no, but that... I'm not going to do so now because the head of MI6 so... is a member of the Garrett. Yeah, so exactly. I, I do sort of disagree in that if you want women to join MI5, the feeder needs MI6, to be there, MI6 yeah. or MI5 or any yeah, of them, yeah. the feeder needs to be there from younger. I don't think this is a specific issue, right. but I'm not sure enough women are being encouraged you know to join. What? Fine, but nothing to do with the Garrett. They'll come for yeah. the Masons next. Right. University campuses have become a hotbed of pro-Palestine activism in recent months. Now, this story, as we understand it, is still going on, OK? A group of students at the University of Bristol have gone to extraordinary lengths, barricading themselves inside a university building yesterday and insisting they won't leave until the institution ends its complicity in genocide. It comes just days after another group of Bristol Uni students occupied a separate building. Luckily for us, they've been documenting their escapades on social media. These students at the University of Bristol are currently in occupation of the Victoria rooms. We are asking the university to end their complicity in the genocide in Gaza. Hello, it is day three of our occupation of the Victoria rooms. Hi guys, it's day six of occupation and we still haven't heard anything from management. Our university chooses profit over people. Hi, it's day 10 of our occupation and we're still waiting for the Vice-Chancellor to respond to our demands while the indiscriminate attacks of Palestinians continues. Free, free, Palestine! OK, the woke students are demanding the university cuts all ties with arms companies and introduces an academic and financial boycott of Israel. Just to add insult to injury, they're demanding the university provides them with food 
and medical supplies. Leave them in there. Just a thought. I like that one. It's day six. We still haven't heard anything from university <laughs> management. It's starting to panic a bit. Mark, what do you reckon to that? Well, eventually they're going to run out of pot noodles, aren't they? Um, and at that point, they'll probably, they'll probably end it. Look, it's, it's crazy. I can remember when I was at university, there were all sort of student union motions about writing letters to Saddam Hussein and this sort of stuff, as if, they, as if you were going to change the world. Look, whatever your stance is on the Middle East, the idea that Bristol University is at the apex of Middle Eastern <laughs> geopolitics, what utter nonsense and arrogance. Yeah. If you want to protest, you know, protest in a civilised way, I don't know, outside the Israeli embassy. But, but I, I'd leave them in there. I mean, it's not... No. I think it's not their property I either, right? I hope their parents are happy. Look... Sebastian, Tarquin and Clelia have excelled themselves <laughs> here. Look, this is, again, it's trendy to do this stuff. This is virtual signalling. Uh, again, our government can't change the Gaza situation. What do they think Bristol they're going to do? Bristol. Right? <laughs> this is typical left-wing idiot student, students making noise uh, you know, and getting attention. Like They're loving it. This, I'd like to see where this ends. You know, you see someone all of a sudden at your local bowls club. Bosh, the door comes in, someone's in there. I will not play bowls at this club until you end being complicit <laughs> in genocide. Like, We're at a bowls club, what have we got to do with any of this stuff? I think it's really nice that they care this much, and I think if you're that age and you don't care about something that deeply, whatever it is, then there's something wrong with you. And do I find the fact that they're all terribly middle class a bit eyebrow raising, yes. I went to Bristol. I'm familiar with the kind of people who go to Bristol. Mm. I'm also very aware that that building they're in is used for exams and basically nothing else. Yeah. So they could be there until the summer. So they're occupying um, a, 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 a almost permanently empty building. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it was for exams, so I went there once. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do understand that they feel incredibly strongly about this, and I understand they want to make a difference, and mm. I think it's mean to laugh at them a little bit. No. no Maybe not, they are a bit silly, no, but... Uh, didn't we all care about things when we were 20? They're missing their weekly showers. But didn't that, you... That is the problem. I, the, you know, those, trust me, those girls are getting blow dry. Yeah. Surely. But the, the, the whole... I mean, which was the university a couple of years ago where there was some demo, sort of just stop oil or yeah, eco worries? Yeah. And I think the bursar of the college said, OK, well, we'll start by switching off all the heating then. Yeah, <laughs> And good. see how you, you like but that. Did you not care about things like that when you were younger? Did you not have passions for no, things? No, I was going yeah, nightclubs. Uh, no, uh, yes, I did, but I, I didn't express them by sitting, you know, in an empty hall for six weeks. I I'm not sure what the right way to protest them. is. However somebody protests, we always criticise it. No, I mean, you can protest in a whole range of ways. It's not going to get anywhere. And the idea that Bristol University is complicit in genocide well, in the Middle East is they, just bananas. It's because they have connections with organisations which are okay. directly connected. But, all right, all right, all right. So, now... Nike's new England football kit has sparked controversy, and it wasn't because of the eye-watering £85 price tag. No, it was Nike's bizarre decision to break with tradition and make the St George's Cross multicoloured in what it calls a playful update to unite and inspire. Reform UK's star signing Lee Anderson led the chorus of outraged MPs who branded the uh, national kits woke rubbish. Um, I don't, could we just leave that on the screen for a second? I don't know if that's possible, because I just want to have a, have a good look at that, really, because that is um, not our flag. No. And no, that, someone's been paid not. a lot of money for that. <laughs> that clearly well. is not the Cross of St George, <laughs> is it? I mean, it's nothing like the yeah, Cross of St George. Yeah, but guys, imagine being triggered by a T-shirt. Like, what snowflakey behaviour? I don't know if it's... No, I get what you mean, but, like... It's I think just it's a T-shirt. I'll be honest with you, this is our national flag. Are the uh, other ones still available for purchase? Could you buy one that didn't have that on? Oh, no, because it's the new shirt. There's, the there's the no day, way. So if I went on the internet right now, I couldn't buy the original one. Why are they meddling with our national flag? Why do you care? It's a T-shirt. Because it's our national flag. Don't put it on it. I'd rather it not That's be on there. I agree with that. I mean, a, a club, clubs, I mean, I'm a big Southampton fan. We, we have our own emblem. And if they suddenly decided to make that emblem pink or purple, yeah. or short, I'd, that I'd would really hurt. That would really hurt your feelings. Well, I'm no, really I'm, sad I'm about that. that. I want the correct emblem on that. Oh, that sweetie. would really hurt my feelings. I just think these people are clearly it's mad the and football shirt. Just put the right emblem not... on the shirt. And Why it, not? It's Everybody here pounds. wasn't held enough as a child. But that's because eighty-five you pounds. Need to calm down. Can I just say? It's hundred and thirty quid. It's a cheese. Can I just say? I love the optics of this because I reckon this is a conversation that's been had like maybe down. Maybe down the pub or at home or whatever, where the three blokes say, It's the England football show. Do you not get it? Right? Do you not get it? Anyway, I think we, we should organise a sit in about it. A sit in yeah. until that's the, the conversation ends. You, you don't care, do you? 
I super don't. I think it's hilarious <laughs> that people who get really upset, who call really really me a snowflake about other things, now think this man. I get very fine, upset. Fine, fine. All right, all right. Coming We're up. All coming. About We're all snowflakes about something. We're all snowflakes about something. But football's more important. Anyway, <laughs> coming up, do you agree with Dame Andrea Jenkins when she says that she doesn't want primary school children learning about any sex education? Or, of course, changing gender. More of that when I crown tonight's greatest president, and union jackass. But next, should BBC Radio 4's Justin Webb have been found guilty of bias by the broadcaster for saying trans women, in other words, males? That's what he said. It's Patrick Christie's Tonight, only on GB News. This is GB News. Britain's News Channel. Now, I'm sure you have seen this video that went viral this week, and if you I haven't, haven't well, I think you're going to enjoy it. Uh, this is a firefighter leaning on a fence whilst watching a trapped driving instructor's car sink <laughs> in four feet of flood water. Looks very comfortable there, doesn't he? Just leaning against the fence. Just chilling, just yeah. relaxing. <laughs> uh, yeah, there were two... Uh, so there were, in fact, two Essex fire and rescue crews, an ambulance and a police car parked near the sinking vehicle, but they wouldn't enter the water because they had to wait for specialist crews who were trained for, uh, for the water depth. Uh, well, two people who weren't going to sit back and watch were these two, Jack and Danielle Price, who took it upon themselves to rescue the submerged driver. And Danielle joins us now. Very good morning to you, Danielle. And you are a hero, an absolute hero. What happened in this video? Make sense of it for us. So we were filming in the area for our YouTube channel and we've seen the fire brigade come through. I was actually out at five o'clock in the morning with my husband, Jamie. We, we know it always happens there, as you can see. Um, and it was clear. We've seen the fire brigade come through. We've followed them and they're just standing around as if nothing's happened. Um, in the clip, it says um, he's fine. He's, he's, he's on his phone um, and then sort of walked away. But what they failed to realise is when my partner actually opened the door, as you can hear, He's on the phone to the, the the sort of the emergency crew in panic, thinking he's going to sink. Um, so we could not just sit there and watch. Um, he's absolutely terrified. Yeah, poor bloke. Well done, you. Do you reckon this is health and safety gone mad? It is because although I do sympathise with them, they are so red taped. But surely, sort of common sense has to kick in as open the door. Welcome back. Time now for more of tomorrow's newspaper front pages. Let's do it. The Express. Pension triple lock will be in Tory manifesto. OK, Rishi Sunak will give pensioners an election guarantee that the triple lock will remain. You know that thing we're already doing? We're going to keep doing it. Ha! Ah, and then they treat it like a victory. But I suppose it's good. The Sun. Street Fighter. Coronation Street star Tina O'Brien is seen caught in the middle of a vicious brawl between teenage girls near her home. The five-foot-one actress, 40, good detail here, threw punches and put one in a headlock, but was also hit in the head. Right, fine, I hope there's a video. OK, The Times. Starmer must listen to black voices, says Baroness Lawrence. Circus Starmer's advisor on race relations has accused the Labour leader of failing to listen to her. Defeats deal fresh blow to Rwanda migrant bill. That's the other one that they've got on the uh, start of the... Uh, the start, the front of the Times. Uh, the start of the Times. Anyway, the mirror. The lipstick, makeup and leopard print go unworn. My Julie is fading away. Julie Goodyear's husband has told of his heartbreak at losing the Corrie legend to dementia. There we go, OK. Um, right, so those are all of your front pages for tomorrow. I am joined, as ever, by director of the Popular Conservatives, Mark Littlewood, businessman and activist Adam Brooks, author and journalist Rebecca Reid. Now, here's a story that landed today that I thought we should debate. Junior doctors in England have overwhelmingly voted to stage more strikes in their long-running pay dispute. Doctors voted by 98% of those who voted, by the way, in the ballot to continue industrial action in the next six months. It was a turnout of 62%, so, you know, all right. The British Medical Association argues that strikes are needed because while workload and waiting lists are at record highs, junior doctors' pay has been cut by more than a quarter in real terms since 2008. Um, Adam, I'll start with you on this. Are they actually now responsible for the problems in our NHS, not the government? Yes, at the end of the day, these strikes have made our waiting lists even longer. They have probably cost thousands of lives. 
I, I think that's undeniable that these strikes have, uh, have not cost many, many lives. Now, I would like to think a junior doctor goes into the profession to help and to save lives, not just for the money. Right. They've got a great career ahead of them. Their pensions are renowned around the world in this country. Mm. I think it's greedy and I think it's reckless and it's costing more lives. Do you have solidarity with them? I mean, the fact is as well, I think a lot of people are under the misguided view that this stops under a Labour government and it doesn't because Labour don't want to give them what they want either. No, but I think they might get closer. Um, and I, I think that the doctors are asking for a lot and it sounds like a lot and possibly their PR isn't great because it makes them sound greedy. But nobody is going into medicine because they want to make a lot of money. If you, if oh, you are smart... It. Yeah. No, it's oh, right. If, you're, if you are the kind of person who can get into medical school, you could much, you could easily be something, a management it. consultant and make way more money. OK. That is not the highest paying job you could get with that level no, of tech by some margin. It's, it's not, yeah, but, but I mean, people... It's a job for life. People so, get so, are, so are many. Yeah. Other, so is law, which I, is so I, is accountancy. I always get a bit confused about this. All of the professions that we're told people don't go in for the money, like medicine, teaching, these seem to be the people who strike over their pay an awful lot more than a whole range of other professions. So but if you then, haven't gone in it for the money, that's causing the a lot sector. of damage. Yeah. But that's the you public know, sector. The so obviously uh, bankers aren't striking for more pay because they can't. There isn't a you, there isn't a well, body to in, award you, them you, more you can pay. Strike in the private sector if you wish. But there is no you, there is no singular the awarding are not body. Responsible yeah, for people's lives. So that would be flight attendants, for example, quite regularly go on strike complaining about their pay and conditions. But there is but but when the pe so sorry, are you saying that you think flight attendants are not financially motivated or financially motivated? They are no, they, don't, they don't claim, I decided to become a flight attendant in order to make flying a better place. So they you don't they're doing think, it for the money. So you don't think that doctors go into medicine to They may to well help do, people. but they, it seems to be cake and eat it here. I didn't go in it for the money, but... But I do want to be able to pay my bills. To try and get more but I want to be able to pay my bills and keep a roof over my head and well, live in an expensive city where Does doctors are needed. your view that one of the BMA's junior doctors reps, it turns out, is, you know, fabulously wealthy and that, you know, comes from quite a lot of money as well? No, I think it's if you come from a lot of money, it's fantastic that you're helping people who don't. Right, OK, fair Patrick, enough. Patrick, let's just remember, during COVID, we were told if it saves just one life. We mm. kept, everyone kept saying that to us. If it saves just one life. Right. Now, hundreds, yeah. if not thousands, are dying because these people are striking. It's wrong and it, they need pushback. All right, now, it was only a matter of time until the virtuous BBC ran into the trans tripwire as one of their own stated a controversial biological fact. Radio 4's Today programme presenter Justin Webb dared to say trans women in other words, males, during a discussion last August. This triggered a meltdown at the B with its own complaints unit finding that Webb was guilty of breaching the requirements on impartiality. The decision has now provoked criticism from staff, gender critical activists, and the director general of the BBC, Tim Davy, is suggesting that the outrage has been overhyped. Uh, this is what he had to say on the matter, speaking in front of MPs at the Culture, Media and Sport Committee. I don't think we suffer institutional bias in this area. I mean, the other thing is we have to be kind and caring in this and listen to people and be nice. Now, in that instance, that was a foot fault. It was a breach, but Justin, you know, we talked... I mean, it's a very... It's quite a small thing, but it, it registered... It was just a sentence that wasn't quite right. Is he guilty of this? I don't know you've got no, strong... What, what, what is this obsession with the trans agenda. Why are we pandering to 0.3% of this country? At the end of the day, a trans woman is a man. I don't care if the police tell me I can't say it, you tell me I can't say it. I never would. It's a man. Yeah. A trans woman is a man. Facts over feelings. Right. And I won't be told ever that that's a woman, because it's not a woman. Mark? Well, I, I agree with that. There's no bias here, because it's a statement of biological fact. And I'm a bit worried what we just heard from Tim Davey. Oh, this is just... This is quite a small thing. Actually, if you say to one of your leading presenters, Justin Webb, you're guilty of bias, I would say that's quite a big goddamn thing for a broadcaster to do. It's not a small thing. So he's got to pick a lane, Tim Davey. He's either going to clamp down on this or he's going to let people speak the truth on air. OK, as a woman, your views? I think this is being turned into something it isn't. He wasn't trying to make a big sweeping statement or a political statement. Mm. He did the thing, sometimes people say coloured when they mean person of colour, because the correct term is close lexically to the incorrect term. And he, what he was trying to say, I'm pretty sure, is assigned male at birth. He, he has no track record of making this his major issue at all. And I think it shows a real uh, negativity in how he treats so people. It's worse. In a way, it's worse that you, you think, in your, in your a, view, I that really he's, think he's it's actually not even, no. he's not even done an Adam Brooks and gone, 
no. you know, that's a bloke, right? I don't that's think that's what you just think. misspoken. But I think we are so ungenerous to people in, in any kind of broadcast that we're so willing for them to be wrong all the time. And I think that's what this is really about. I think it's just mean, honestly. Good grief. I mean, sometimes I just want to stop the world and get this, off. This, this, this whole creep, we, we, you've got J.K. Rowling, you know, people are threatening her with the police for saying a trans woman is a man. Mm. We've got new Scottish laws. The world is falling apart and we're focusing on, on... feelings of men that want to be women. Mm. Why? All right. Well, on that note, it's time to reveal today's greatest Britain in Union jackass. <laughs> Mark, your greatest Britain, please. Uh, this is the Business Secretary and Equality Minister, Kemi Badenoch, who's just released a report basically showing that all this diversity and inclusion stuff that we go around practising gets us absolutely nowhere, does not improve diversity, equality and inclusion, and actually, in certain instances, sends us backwards on these things. So all of this, what are your pronouns, what lanyard should you wear, Turns out, this is not bringing us a more joyous, inclusive society. Quite the opposite. All Good right. on her. She says she's going to um, have some new plans in the next few weeks. Another framework, I guess. But at least she's got this report. All right. I like okay. That. Go on, Adam. Is your greatest? Mine is Dame Andrea Jenkins, MP, for her speech on gender ideology that's being taught in primary schools and sex education. I think we might have a Dame Andrea package on this. I think. As a mother of a child of primary school age myself, I do not want him or other children to learn about sex full stop, whether that's straight or gay. I also do not want to see young children at primary school to be taught about changing gender. OK, uh, all right. Um... Yours, Chris Brisson. Uh, mine is the University of Bristol students because I think it's oh, really nice to see gosh. young people caring about things. Better than apathy. I didn't go to any, any protest at university. I just went to the pub. Yeah. yeah. Well done. Well, <laughs> no, that's bad. That's bad. 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 Look at where we all are. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I should, if I got it out of my system, I wouldn't be bothering you guys. Apathy is very all right, underrated. All right, all right. Today, today's greatest president is Dave Andrea Jenkins. Right, OK. Uh, Union Jackass time. Go on, Mark. Uh, my Union Jackass is Simon Case, the head of the civil service. We were discussing earlier on the show, Patrick, that the head of MI6 has suddenly decided to leave the Garrick Club because he's discovered that women can't be members. The chief civil servant has made exactly the same call today. And this is just a day after he told a select committee that he wanted to stay as a member of the Garrett Club to try and reform it. Oh, More woke virtue signaling. Oh, my. That's why I say about working here. Oh, okay. Mine is a man I've had a bit of a spat on Twitter with today. It's Jeremy Vine. <laughs> Um, for airing the question of whether Twitter should be temporarily shut down uh, because of all the conspiracy theories that are doing the rounds at the we, moment. We've got a clip of this as well, apparently. It all sound crazy, but China does it. We've got to now take control of Twitter and, and shut it down for the time being. Right, OK. So, I mean, I, I, I haven't seen that before, so I don't know. This is the first time hearing of it. So you had a bit of beef with them, did you? Yeah. I, I, right, I just okay. think, you know... Twitter spat. Right. Yeah, Twitter. I just, I just think right. it's mad to even ask the question, why should Twitter be shut down because right. we don't like some of the things that are being said? All right, all right. we're going to have to be quite quick. Yeah. My understanding is that there is a fuller version of that, that it might be. I know, he's, he's tweeted me. Don't um, worry about that. Specifically, I have Angela Jenkins for, as my uh, union jackass because I think oh. it is abhorrent to suggest that age-appropriate sex education for primary school children should be banned. She doesn't want any sex ed, no basic biological facts in primary schools, and that is disastrous. All experts in child development agree. Okay. Oh, all right. Well, obviously, she's not going to be that because we've just had a new greatest <laughs> prison, but there we go. Today's Union Jackass is Simon Case for just lobbing his Garrick tie in the ocean uh, because apparently there's no women in there and he's just realised that for the first time ever. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed tonight's show. It's been top draw from top to bottom. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I will be back tomorrow at 9pm. Up next, it's Headliners. They'll be whizzing you through all of the front pages in much more detail, so make sure you stay tuned. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Evening. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Most of England and Wales will be dry and bright after a bit of a dull start. Scotland and Northern Ireland turning wet and increasingly windy tomorrow thanks to this weather system approaching from the Atlantic. We've had this set of weather fronts sitting across us today, made for a pretty damp day for parts of England and Wales. Still a few heavy showers around through the evening, but tending to clear away, most becoming dry through the night until that next band of rain makes for a damp start over the highlands and the west of Northern 
Northern Ireland on Thursday morning. Could be quite murky across the south tomorrow as well. A lot of mist, a low cloud settling in through the night. So don't be surprised if it's not a little drab first thing on Thursday morning. Could even be some fog patches around. It should steadily clear through the morning. And then most of England and Wales dry and bright. A bit of patchy rain could affect North Wales, Northern England at times. Certainly wet in Western Scotland. That rain moving from west to east across Northern Ireland to 